Again, good morning, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Greater Wausau Region Chamber of Commerce, I'm happy to present our 2019 Economic Development uh, Program. So thank you for being here. Uh, wow, uh, what a group. Uh, this. Uh, we're going to lock the doors and we are going to get something done today. This is really impressive. So uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, the 2019 Economic Outlook Program uh, is presented by People State Bank. Thank you, People State Bank. Uh, my name uh, is Michael Loy. As most of you know, I'm the CEO of North Central Healthcare and a member of the Chamber Board of Directors. A few housekeeping items before we begin. As a courtesy to the speakers and attendees, please uh, turn off your mobile devices. Uh, the restrooms are located right uh, behind the conference room, uh, back behind the table. And for those who are seated with their backs to the stage, please feel free to turn your chairs throughout the presentations. We've got a full room here today, and again, that's really great to see. Again, as we begin the event, uh, we'd like to thank People State Bank for their presenting sponsorship of today's event. People's has been a 56-year member of the chamber and is dedicated to the communities it serves by truly giving back which includes supporting events like this. Here is a short video on People's State Bank. Good morning, I'm Scott Kaplan, President and CEO of People's State Bank. Welcome to the Wausau Region Chamber's 2019 Economic Outlook Breakfast. We're happy to be the presenting sponsor of today's event. People's opened in 1962 on Wausau's west side to meet the financial needs of local business owners, their families, and their employees. Since then, we've expanded to $900 million in total assets in over 11 locations, including more offices in Milwaukee and Stevens Point. Our growth is built on excellent customer service. In a recent customer survey, show people's customers are nearly three times more likely to refer people's to a friend than a typical bank's customer. I'm excited about the work being coordinated by our Chamber of Commerce to bring the Wausau area business, nonprofit, and government leaders together to increase business development by focusing on the same priorities. Looking back at Wausau's history, it's easy to see the entrepreneurial spirit that built our metro area. People's has been a partner in those past activities, and although we have grown into other areas of Wisconsin, Wausau remains our home and continues as the majority of our business and operations. A growing local economy helps all of us, employers, employees, the disadvantaged, and investors, and People State Bank continues to assist in those efforts. There are difficult decisions and much hard work ahead thank you for supporting Wausau's future. <laughs> Let's give People State Banks a round of applause. I would also like to take the time to thank all of today's sponsors, our two platinum sponsors, the Dirks Group and Ruder Ware, our silver sponsor, Wisconsin Public Service Corp, and then our facility sponsor, City Grill Restaurant and Event Space. Thank you all. It is now my pleasure to introduce our Chamber's President and CEO, Dave Ekman. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me down that way? I just want to make sure I'm getting in the mic here. So good morning, everybody. It's uh, great to see all of you here this morning. Uh, really heartened. Um, tremendous uh, uh, showing, especially with the fog and, and perhaps the ice conditions. Um, you know, it was interesting yesterday, um, not only you being here, but trying to get our presenters here. Um, in a bit of irony, um, we're pulling somebody from North Carolina and somebody from Texas to get here. And it was the fog and not a massive snowstorm or the polar vortex that really posed the challenge. And, uh, but 
I, I told my wife Saturday, I said we're in trouble because you know when you get these weather, and this warm weather and you get the snow. Okay, and so um, John gets to, to Minneapolis, St. Paul about 10.30 and says, oh, we're good to go. John's here. Now we gotta worry about Ted. Ted's moving through O'Hare, which is a nightmare in itself. And uh, so John doesn't get here. I have dinner with John last night at 8 o'clock at night. So he gets on two planes in Minnesota, off two planes in Minnesota, rents a car, drives over. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> Appreciate it. And then, um, so Ted says, I'm in Chicago and I'm waiting. And, and so now, it's, now we're worried about the fog, and uh, especially at night because it gets worse. He gets on a plane and a uh, maintenance problem, so he, they got to move him to a new gate, new plane. And I pick him up at uh, 12.30 in the morning at CWA and get him here. And uh, we each got a little bit of sleep last night. So thanks for, uh, for suffering the toils, okay? Appreciate it. So uh, much of what we see and hear this morning has everything to do with what we collectively, this room and beyond the room, but to the community, have the ability to control in the greater Wausau region and what is being shaped by the 21st century global external economic forces. What we have internally and what's outside. Things that we do not control, but must adapt to if we are to compete in this world. So how do we get to this point? And I wanted to just take some brief, brief time here, just how do we get here? Where we are assembled to learn about the significant threats that face us, but more importantly, where there's opportunities for us if we work together to build a greater Wausau community. So if you were here last year, um, 2018 Economic Outlook Program, we brought in some speakers who really talked about the challenges that we had with our demographic shift. We all are living the talent crisis. If you're not, then I want to talk to you over in the corner and figure out what you're doing, okay? So we know we have a demographic problem, and it's long. It, it's decades long. It's a threat. Um, we're not retaining. People are leaving. We're not re replacing populations. We also have a threat, and it, and, and it was uh, delineated last week again in the uh, uh, Kaufman uh, Entrepreneurial Index, which is a national indicator. Wisconsin is a low performer in high growth, high wage, new disruptive technology entrepreneurship, innovation, the next generation of companies. And so those were the threats that were outlined last year. I got some phone calls after that program and said, so Dave, we heard you, but what really is happening? And then art articulate the data to those people who called, and uh, then a call to action was to occur over some months to say we can sit and take what comes to us, hopefully, or we can be proactive to understand what our, tra our challenges are, what our threats are, and put together a plan to address that. Because when you step back and look at everything, there is no no economic development plan in place for this community. People are doing really good things, organizations, communities, municipalities, large and small, doing things, education, doing things. But they're not aligned, they're not connected, and they're not directed. It's a poor use of resources, uh, not strategic. And I'll tell you, based on what I know, I've been doing this work long enough since 2005 and being in business prior there are other communities like Wausau and smaller that are mobilizing their resources and to compete. Make no doubt about it, we compete. We compete against communities in Wisconsin, we compete against communities in the upper Midwest, in the country, and the world. And so how are we gonna do that? One, by identifying what your threats are through data, through qualitative measures and discussions and focus groups, what people are saying, and you're putting them together, and then articulating a plan based on those threats that where you have real opportunities. So that's where we were. So
So the world we live in today requires a new approach that brings deeper engagement with diverse community stakeholders. This morning, this program will shed greater light on real threats, <coughs> but will also present a pathway of promise to greater opportunities for our and future generations. Assumptions will be checked this morning. You, will, you have some assumptions and they will be checked. If you believe that things remain the same and should remain the same, I ask you to reflect, reflect on a few iconic brands. Wausau Insurance, Wausau Paper, Drott, Murray Machinery, to name a few, okay? And things don't remain the same, things change. The world's changing rapidly, Technical, technological uh, advancements, baby boomers, have new expanded needs as they vacate the workforce and the next generation talent, that being our children and our grandchildren, and the expect expectations that ha they have for a life of work, play in, in living in a community. So my question is, is this morning as we move into this, are we building with intention a community that will ensure vibrancy for sustained economic growth for generations to come? Are we, are we gonna step up and compete? One last mention, it was when I, uh, I went to get uh, Ted last night at the airport, a beautiful facility. And I walked, I was just walking around and forgot about my old friend on the wall, Lane Ware. Many of you know, have worked with Lane Ware. And Lane had a, a strong commitment for a community and I know if he were alive today, he'd be sitting in this room with us. And why I bring him up is because what Lane's spirit is in this community lives through all of us. He touched so many different organizations. I'm asking you to reflect on that, respect that, because if he were here, he'd probably, in fact, he'd probably standing right here right now. That's him. Um, and I wanted to, I saw him because he's got a plaque, his picture, I was walking at the airport, he's got a plaque for all the service he did to help build that airport over 25 years. So, it's my comments, set the context, take it away. <laughs> adjustment there. Uh, so we're going to get along uh, in our program uh, here quickly. Uh, we have an excellent program again here today. We're going to start with really broad strokes from a, a broader economic perspective and then we're going to shift into our new economic development plan and wrap up with a really excellent leadership panel. I think you're going to walk away today uh, really understanding the issues in front of us and what we uh, as a community are going to do about it uh, here in our greater Wausau area. Uh, but before I shift to our first speaker, I just want to talk a little bit about my own personal experience uh, in this community. Uh, I grew up uh, about two hours north of here in a very rural area. I uh, went to UW-Stevens Point for college where I met my wife. Uh, we went from there to the Milwaukee area for five years and then we chose Wausau as the place that we wanted to come back and graze our family. And we've been busy doing that. We have three daughters now uh, that are growing up and starting to go into our school districts. Uh, and it has been a tremendous community to live in, uh, and we really enjoy uh, being residents here and all the things that this community offers. Uh, but I remember coming back here in 2011 and feeling we were coming out of the recession and looking at all the assets we had here in this community and just thinking, wow, uh, this place is really gonna take off. And I think over the last couple of years, uh, the community hasn't reached its full potential. Um, and I think that still lays out ahead of us. And I think that there's still a ton of opportunity uh, for this community to really take off and be uh, really a central focus point of the entire state. And uh, I look forward to that future. And as I was talking with uh, the chamber leadership group yesterday about quality of life in the community and having read uh, the economic development plan that you all will be introduced today, I really connected with where we're going and I looked at all of those individuals who are working in your business and we talked about the importance of the strategies we're going to outlay today and how important it is to the success of this community and they really believe in where we're going and want to be a part of that. So it's an exciting time for our community and we're really looking forward uh, to have this day uh, be that catalyst that moves us forward uh, in the short term. So with that, uh, I would like to take the time and it's my pleasure to introduce you to our first speaker. 
Uh, Ted Abernathy is the managing partner at Economic Leadership LLC. Ted has 30 years, seven years of experience in directing local and regional economic and workforce development programs. Ted will be presenting the current state of Wisconsin's economy and its workforce trends compared to national averages. Please help me in welcoming Ted Abernathy. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So I made a mistake. My, my mother, you'll hear me talk about my mother a lot when you hear me talk, uh, is 85. And two weeks ago, she said, now, where are you going in the next couple weeks? And I started naming places. And I said, I'm going to Wisconsin in two weeks. She said, where are you going to Wisconsin? I said, Wausau. She said, have you ever been there? I said, no. So we hung up the phone. She was about two hours from me. And a, a few minutes later, the ball rings again. It's mom. That's not unusual. And she says, uh, <laughs> I just looked it up. It's 23 below zero. <laughs> I hadn't bothered to look. And she said, I just want you to know I'm going to pray for warmer weather. <laughs> so last night, sitting in O'Hare at 11.30, I called my mother. She doesn't sleep. She's reached that age. And I said, Mom, your warmer weather has me stuck in O'Hare because of the fog. <laughs> she said, well, you got to be more specific next time. <laughs> So, uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, the lady at the front desk was the same person that checked me in at 1.30, so it's really kind of all nice. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work with the uh, Wisconsin Chamber, and uh, we are releasing this week uh, some more specific stuff on workforce, but last fall at the Future Wisconsin Conference, uh, they heard me give something very similar to this presentation, so I'll try to stay on script because he asked me to today. You know, there's a lot of work to do. If you if you set yourself up last year as, you know, we got to get busy. Well, the good news is there are things to do to get busy. The bad news is it's going to take rooms this size with all of you working to do it. Our firm does basically four things. We do all that data analysis for companies and places that you get put in the list with. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good, but everybody has that data now. Uh, we have running bets that in 15 minutes I can tell you about as much about your community as any company ever looking here wants to know. So the data exists, we'll show you some of it today, but we do data analysis. What we do more of than anything else is trend analysis. What's just over the horizon, what's just around the corner, what's going to be impacting you in 2025. Third thing is best practices, and that's what we've been doing for the state chamber. Who's doing a good job with workforce around the country? What are they doing? What can we steal? Who's doing a good job in Wisconsin? Because a lot of great programs up here, most of them are not statewide, most of them are local, they haven't been scaled. And so what can we do about that? We used to come up with all these great plans, and then the fourth thing became, how do communities actually do anything about it? It's one thing to know something, it's a second thing to want to do something about it, but how do you get groups like a chamber board or a city council or a group of community leaders, how do you get them to align what they're trying to do to actually achieve something? That's harder than it sounds, but if, for those of you who are of an age and been doing this for a while, you know it's not, it's hard. It's not a fake thing, it's hard to get things done. So we try to spend our time trying to help communities do that. We always start with the economy in groups. The good news is, and I, I can put the 101, so I had to turn this in a week or so ago, 101 straight months of private sector job growth in America, the longest extended private sector growth in our history. So when people say, how's the economy? The answer is, that's been pretty good for a long time. And some of you know that the next one I'll put up there is 20. It's a little bitty one from last month. And we'll see if that's an anomaly, because there's a couple of anomalies up there, or whether we're seeing to see something else. But long term, expansion. Wisconsin, if you look over the last 10 years, you're a little below average. 35th fastest growing state when it comes to jobs. And you can see there are places that uh, you know are higher, lower percentage-wise, you're just below the midpoint. Manufacturing jobs. Nationally, almost everybody's percentage-wise loss. You've done better than most. Your manufacturing industry is stronger. It's not output. Manufacturing output's up almost everywhere. 
But as you know, and many of you are out or in manufacturing in the room, automation, efficiencies, lots of things have improved what you can put out of an individual plant. Individual productivity of manufacturing workers <coughs> continues to rise. Manufacturing is not as pretty a picture, though. All those things always up. Manufacturing's up and down and sideways. And it has to do with everything. It has to do with cycles and orders and customers and global demand and I mean all sorts of things impact manufacturing. So it's not as easy to figure out what it's going to look like the next quarter. So quarter to quarter stuff's not very good for manufacturing. This is what Wisconsin looks like compared to the country. So if you go back to 1990 and you take every year the percent change in jobs, the U.S. is the blue and Wisconsin is the red. And you can see there's some inflection points along the way. A couple things you should take away from a slide like this. The first is all those people who tell you that state economies can be a whole lot different than national economies have been watching national economies. If you're a little bitty energy state, you can look a lot different. But otherwise, you're basically looking like a national economy, either a little better or a little worse, about the same. For job growth, Wisconsin's been trailing for the last group of years. You can see as you come out of recession, you were about even, you were, you were doing a little below the, the norm in the late 2000s, but you come out and you've not been growing as fast with jobs. Now, at the end there, as the country slowed down a little, you've maintained your level, it's gotten closer. But there's a gap in your performance. You look around the state, that gap is really different in different places. This is the last five years. Overall, the state's job markets, jobs have grown 5.4%. You guys are easy to find. I really appreciate that, by the way. We're going to the places we haven't been, and everything looks so but you got this big square in the middle. It's great to find. Your growth's been strong here. But you can see around the state, if you think, put yourself in a policymaker's head for a few minutes. If you're, tr you're trying to have you know, even peanut butter on the bread, if you will, nobody has it anywhere in America. It looks like this everywhere, places that are doing better, places that are doing worse. This is gross domestic product over the last 10 years. You're right in the middle, 24th. So while your job numbers haven't been as high, your gross domestic product's been pretty good, which means your output's been doing better. This is last year's gross domestic product. You can see that uh, you're one of the well, lighter blue. So I went to North Carolina, so there's dark blue. I know they're supposed to be good up there. They're deep blue. We don't like them. But we like that light blue that you are. You're in the middle. This is what you look like with GDP, and your GDP has maintained its level with the national economy. You're right. You're not outperforming, but you're right at the national economy. And this is annual wages. You're rate 28. Your wage growth has been a little below the national average. This is the last 12 months, the last year, and you can see that uh, Wisconsin is just slightly below the national average, 1.6% growth compared to 1.8 nationally. If you drill it down a little more, there are areas where your state's doing better. So construction is actually much higher than the national average, which is a good sign because that's usually a leading indicator, which means the next year or so look pretty good here. That's a good thing to see. Manufacturing growth has been better. Good for a place like Wausau, who's manufacturing uh, dependent. Professional and technical services is the big one down at the bottom that's a problem. That's one of the top growth areas in the country. It tends to go to strong urban regions. As a state, your urban regions aren't as strong as other places, urban regions. This is what you look like with your neighbors. Pretty good. You're in a neighborhood where the growth numbers have not been quite as high as the country. But I keep asking Kurt, trying to figure out who are you supposed to be competing with? I mean, I got a lot of 50 state charts up there and they're confusing on a wall. If I put who do you think you compete with on the chart, I get different answers. And I know you're the upper Midwest, and I'm sort of, I'm going to Missouri next week. They don't know what they are. They don't know if Kansas City is sure they're the West. St. Louis is sure they're the East. And Springfield is, is absolutely sure it's the South. So I don't know what they are. But trying to figure out who you're competing with, who are those places, is important. It's important for people at the state level. It's also important for you. Because you're not going to end up on every list for new investment but you're gonna end up fighting with the same people fairly regularly. So that's nice top of the level data. What I wanted to 
impress upon you today is people don't just use top of the level data anymore. You can go a little deeper. You can look at tech sector growth. You can see that what's kind of right dead center, 25th fastest growing for tech jobs. Tech jobs are defined as 87 different NAICS codes. We can tell you exactly what's all in it, but you're right in the middle. So you're not a fast growing tech state. You're not a losing tech state. One of the things up there that's interesting is just look at how many states in a world where technology is expanding are actually losing tech jobs. It's a winners and losers trend that we see everywhere. This is tech sector growth in the last five years. You're in the middle. You can see big swaths of the country losing tech jobs, and tech jobs continuing to concentrate in a few states. You can get real deep. You can start looking at your advanced industry growth and see where the, the uh, opportunities have been. Architectural engineering firms have grown. Software publishers have grown. Scientific development has grown. This is all statewide data that we're doing for the state chamber, but you can drill that down and try to really understand your community. I'm sure John and his team has done that. And when you start measuring your competitiveness, I mean, is there anybody here who doesn't think you're competing every day on everything? I mean, you're measuring competitiveness. So the first rule is you just stop drinking your own Kool-Aid. We tell every community we go to, there's community folklore about yourself that just isn't what everybody else sees. Might be true, by the way. I'm not telling you you're, you're delusional, might be, but I'm not telling you that. <laughs> but I'm telling you that everybody else looks at data. So when you start trying to figure out where you are, look around. Now this last year, the top factors for uh, companies looking at new investment, highway accessibility, labor costs and availability, quality of life popped up to number four. I'll tell you talk about that in a minute. Then some cost factors. In fact, the biggest moves this last year were quality of life went from four to 10, or 10 to four, never been in the top 10 before the year before. And the reason for that is how. I mean, it's nice that we all like our communities and we all live places we want to live, but when people are looking at it from a competitive standpoint, they're trying to figure out, can I get new employees to move here? That's what talent means. And the, the other one that's interesting to watch is supply networks. Logistics and proximity to supply networks is actually changing around the country. Many of you know this better than I do, but as we're watching firms, we're watching those supply chains get narrower. And we're seeing globalization shifts too, so that's something to keep watching. All sorts of people rank everybody. So the Tax Foundation overall rank, you're below average, 32nd. It's a problem. Uh, your sales tax rank is good. Your employment insurance rank is not good. Cato looks at freedom indexes, some things good, regulatory pretty good, fiscal policy not as good. Alex does rich state, poor states, your numbers are mostly in the middle. Your economic outlook's actually a little better than average, which is good. Then everybody, Forbes had you 33rd as best state for business, and US News and Report had you 11th. You say, well, how does that happen? Well, they're multi-factor things, it depends on what you count. So they're good examples in Wisconsin. Your labor force participation rate, I think I've got another slide on that later. Top 10, Wisconsin works, pretty good. Exports high, your, your schools are great. When we start doing things on um, school performance, your kids perform well. On the other side, entrepreneurial, babe, sorry you mentioned it, but that's last year, so new one just came out, you didn't improve. Your population growth, we'll talk about in a minute. And your productivity manufacturing output per employee is lower than I would expect. And I told uh, several people here, that's something I'd look at closely. So this is an ugly chart, I apologize for it. But every year, our firm, all those people who rank people, like what we call the beauty pageants, the CNBC, the Forbes, all those things, we rank them every year and plot how everybody ranks you versus how your actual economic performance is to see if it matters. Because we get it asked all the time, does it matter if Forbes thinks you're the number one this, that, or whatever? The answer to the question is, it does a little. If you look at the box down in the bottom, this one, let's see, I don't think I can do that all the way over there. This one, the green one, those are the states that end up in the top group for both the beauty pageants and for performance. So if you look at North Carolina and Colorado and South Carolina and Utah, they're all down here. Everybody thinks they're good, they perform well. If you look up in the top, people don't think they're very good and they perform badly. 
Some people are outside the norm. Here's California. Most people say, oh, no one wants to do business in California except their economic performance continues to be good. And the reason is lots of venture capital, great universities, West Coast ports, all sorts of good things. And there's some people who perform less than you would think. For you guys, dead center, the absolute middle. I don't know, something about that square in the middle. Yep. The middle. But dead center. All right, that's a deeper dive, but we can go a lot deeper than that. When people are looking at you, we do these multi-factor competitive analysis for places, comparing one place to another. And we'll put 30 or 40 of these individual factors together and build indexes. So we'll build climate indexes and workforce index and strength indexes, and then they look like that. Everybody just blink real quick, it'll be all right. <laughs> this is Manufacturing Competitiveness Index, and some of the numbers on these indexes don't have Wisconsin's hydrogen light. These are factors across boards. People are doing these charts all the time when they assess you. So understanding the data all the time matters for you. And some of this down here, you don't do as well in on business climate data or overall infrastructure. Some of it you do better in. Everybody, by the way, does better or worse in some things. The key here is understanding what your, what your role is, what you can do. So I'll give you an example. This is manufacturing growth in America. The top uh, line is the average manufacturing GDP, and the bottom line is jobs. This goes over a period of time, back 20 years. So in America, we have about a third less manufacturing workers than we had. But we produce 43% more than we used to. Now, as you might imagine, every state doesn't look alike. So we do our indexes, which I just showed you, the top number happens to be the best place in America, and that's Minnesota on our index. Their output is, their, their job numbers are down about 20%, their output's up about 87%. The worst place, unfortunately, I do work for them, so nobody tell everybody I, that the slide was up here. But 50th overall is West Virginia. They've lost almost 40% of their jobs, and their output is actually down. So yes, the, the money shot here is that here's Wisconsin. You're not, you only lost about 20% of your manufacturing jobs over that period of time, which is lower than the nation. But your numbers aren't up as much as I would like. If I were looking at it, I'd be looking at productivity output on these kind of things and trying to see what it is. If it's, if it's that you haven't reinvested in new technology as much, you might consider that. If it's if you haven't uptrained or upskilled your workforce, I'd look at that. But there are things that you have to look at. So I'm going to shift gears from data for you for a minute. We're going to all play futurist for a minute. So if you're trying to see what, that's what is, what has been. So what's going to be? So yes, we, we, if you do futurist in America, you have to talk about the Jetsons. That's just, you know, it's, <laughs> everybody who stands on the stage has to talk about the Jetsons. So any, anybody in the room not know the Jetsons? Okay, so yeah, that's amazing. Anybody know how long the Jetsons ran on television? One year. One year. 1964. 22 episodes, you can buy them, they're very cheap and they're fun. Now, in fairness, 25 years later, Nickelodeon picked it up again and did a second season, 25 years later for the 25th anniversary. But the Jetsons were supposed to be projecting 100 years into the future. So the world's gotten a little faster here. I mean, we can talk, when we talk about the future, we're talking about all sorts of trends. There are more trends out there than you know what to do with. And a trend is not a tangent, it's not a guess at how the world's going to change. A trend is something you can follow to know where it's headed. <coughs> so when we look at trends, there are some that are obvious. Urbanization is an obvious trend. More people are moving to cities. Living longer is an obvious trend. We're living much longer than we used to. There are more gray-haired people in the room today that are still working and still think we're ruling the world than there would have been 20 years ago in this room. The world's more diverse, and there are lots more young people, and millennials are running the world now, so they look like that. And globalization, even though it's slowed recently. I don't know. How many, how many millennials in the room? Raise your hand. Y'all know y'all in charge. <laughs> but if you want to keep us happy, let us keep thinking it. It's okay. Sure. Urbanization is an interesting thing. The, the, the concept of bigger being better is not necessarily true, 
But when you look at communities by size since the recession, the bigger the communities, the higher the percentage job growth. Straight line. Now, it's not everyone, but on average, it looks like that. Again, that life expectancy thing, which I, I appreciate much more every day. <laughs> I do. I mean, you know, life expectancy for men has gone from 67 to 75. I mean, it's pretty good, you know. Here's your problem. If I look at Wisconsin, of almost every problem I see that needs addressing, this is the top one, which is your population growth projections for a 30 year period, 94% per, of all the growth net is gray haired people. Or people who dye their hair, some interesting color. My mother, so it's okay. We know that we're going to be nationally many more diverse people than we've been in the past. And I would challenge you to look around the room. I was in New Orleans last week, I'll be in St. Louis. Next, rooms don't look quite like this, right? They're more diverse. That's where the growth's coming from. Um, disruption is another trend. Now, 10 years ago, we didn't have any of this stuff that we live by today. I, uh, I felt bad last night, they'd come to get me. I said, I'll just get an Uber from the airport. He said, oh. I said, all right, I said, all right, I'll take a taxi. Uh. So it's a great ride in, thank you. Yeah, that, that's a little bit. Anybody in the room not have a smartphone? Look at this. Nobody had a smartphone 11 years ago. They didn't exist. Everybody had their mom's flip phone, right? You probably have, she probably has the one that you had then, right? <laughs> that's a different world we live in, right? Now the question is, what's next? What's coming at us? I mean, Industry 4.0 is sweeping over so fast in robotics and advanced materials that basically we're disrupting everything. And so we start looking into the future. I, you know, I ask people about the Jetsons, they say, where's the flying car? Well, it's right there. Mm -hmm. That's in Abu Dhabi. That folding phone is this year. <coughs> we're all, two years from now, all our phones are going to fold. Except the one you gave your mother, but it's what you have. Right? I mean, that's where we're headed. And oh my, chat box. Okay, how many people in the room have talked to their device this morning? Raise your hand if you have. Look at this. All right. How many of you had their advice talk back to you and solve your problem? Yeah, right, right. I mean, think about this. I mean, how far are we? from the question that John and I are going to go out of business because you're going to walk up to your, your bot and you're going to go, give me an economic analysis of our region and tell us how we're doing recently and it's going to print it out and you're going to walk over to your printer and pick it up or your really big dry pad. But, I mean, they're getting more sophisticated every day. So this got me in trouble at the uh, future Wisconsin problem this year. So <laughs> who's in the school system here? Okay, now, so let's take a look here. This is imaginary. <laughs> what I'm about to say is not a prediction, nor is it a recommendation. Right, Kurt? They, they were not happy with me, were they? No, okay. So, 2,000 CEOs were asked this year about education. 57% said the school systems aren't meeting their needs. Everybody, we do this, that we hear school around the country. School systems aren't fast enough, they're not changing fast enough. So I threw this up as just a way to think about the future. And it got me in trouble. So, I mean, nobody would have thought about the University of Phoenix before the University of Phoenix, right? Now, a thousand people have been thinking about it, but it hadn't scaled. So I said, what if we got a national high school that business accredited the courses? And it was a combination of homeschool and reworking space and, and historic buildings in downtown, and you had world-class people teaching via information, you know, via electronics, and there was an AI grading system that was machine learning to help every child individually, and there were all these third party people doing sports and arts and band, and it was self-paced, it was online, it was 24-7, 365, and people would learn at their own pace. Somebody's thinking about that. Now, I, I'm not recommending it, I promise. <laughs> I'm just saying that disruption is coming. 
And right now, the only things I'm sure of from a trend standpoint is the world's accelerating, the world's getting more complex, and every one of our lives and businesses are getting disrupted. Anybody disagree with any of those three? So we've got to think differently than we used to think. The, the, the big things are at the intersections. It's quantum computing. If quantum computing happens, it changes the game on, on data analytics. Machine learning, AI, and genomics. 20 years from now, we're going to look back at this period of time and think, this is quite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we, didn't, we got up in the morning, we went over and ground the coffee. We didn't have the robot make the French press for us at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to stick build houses. Now we can pour them out and injection mold them in a day. All of that leads me to the, the work we've been doing with Wisconsin and where we're headed and where we'll be rolling out some things this week. And I fact, in Wausau on Monday, or Monday, talent is an issue for everybody. Now, for those of you who are not Star Wars fans, the four of you in the room that aren't Star Wars fans, some of you remember that in episode four, the first movie, that 3 CPO said to Han Solo, sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,700 and 20 to 1. And Han said, Correct. Never tell me why. So I, I want to go ahead and thank you. I am running, I'm running, a, I'm running a, an experiment this year. So for everybody in, in all of my talks this year, more than three quarters of the people who answer that question are female. So this flyboy, geek boy, sci-fi thing, I don't think it's real. I think, I think it's real. You know, so I know, I know it's not, I know it's not, you know, statistically real. But this is what we have in talent today. By the way, that's exactly what they said. Never tell me the odds. And the reason they said that is there was this huge ship shooting lasers into the back of his ship, and he had no choice. He was going in. But we have no choice but to deal with the workforce issue. No choice. Because we're sitting around trying to balance supply and demand and workforce in a system that looks more like that. And it makes our head explode. And we really don't want to do it, except we don't have any choice our asteroid field with workforce is pretty simple. There's demographics, some of which I've told you, that are really causing issues. And, and our declining mobility and lower labor force participation rates. We also have an economy where we're at a 50-year low on unemployment rates and the longest expansion. We've got mismatches because things are changing so fast. We've got technological displacement because that's changing. And we're having a national crisis debating what's better or worse from a modeling standpoint on how you train and educate people. All of those are part of our asteroid field. So I asked the group before, and I'll ask you, can we at least agree, as a group, given that there's lots of issues, that a qualified, skilled, productive workforce is the competitive issue for your future? Yes? Yeah. Can we agree that change is rapid and getting faster? Can we agree that it's going to impact jobs? Right? Simple stuff, right? So can we agree that this is all important, but aligning our action is hard. The challenges are complex. The solutions aren't simple. You cannot find your silver bullet for this issue, no matter how hard you look. And finally, we need to agree as a group that there are many, many, many players and stakeholders that are real stakeholders in this. And that collaboration and alignment of those people takes time and it takes money and it takes energy and it takes sustained effort. So given that, we're trying to really just to do two things. We're trying to balance the supply demand problem. On one side, we've got automation and robotics and the loss of jobs. And on the other side, we've got slowing birth rates and aging baby boomers and immigration debates. And we're trying to find some leveling as both sides change. So the rate of national labor force growth has slowed dramatically. We are approaching the point where our labor force growth as a country is going to be negative. Now that's, I mean, that's a long way down from 2.6% to 0.2%. Remembering that unemployment rate now is a 50-year low. So next mild recession, we'll think we've got a little reprieve on this. But the long-term problem is the same. This issue of change of population in the last five years, 
You're in the middle there looking green, that's nice. The neighborhood north of you does not look quite as good. So your <clears throat> supply area, your labor shed, problem for you. This is your population 25 to 44 as a state going back to the 70s. And you flattened out, then that's an issue for you, retaining those people. This is your working age population in Tim and projected 30 years later, the same. Now, maybe there will be automation and this will all work out, but it's a problem. This is the projected workforce population from 2015 to 2035. You're not quite, you're not green here. There's strain on you here. You're going to have to be a place that attracts more people. Place making and talent attraction is going to have to be a priority long term. As you can see, by the way, most states have something that looks a lot like this. Their rural areas are red, their urban areas are green. Lots of parts of most states look like that. We're also hampered by our mobility rates. As a country, we move about at half the rate we used to as people. I know it sounds like everybody moves around, but changing states is now about half what it was 25 years ago. And domestic migration is a mixed bag. You can see in Illinois, I know it's fun to pick on if you're in Wisconsin, and they're losing pretty badly, but lots of places are. And we do a tab, one of those other geeky things we do with data is a talent attraction <coughs> index. The great news for you here, we measure everything from change in STEM jobs to white collar jobs to engineering degrees. And you guys in the middle here are in the blue part, which is good, which tells us that you've got the ability to attract talent with a concerted effort to do so. This is your participation rate. You're not going to squeeze a ton more out of it. You're already a top 10 state for participation in Wisconsin. So as I said, people here work. The second piece of this is that balance between employers wanting more and more skills and more and more people going to college every year and graduating every year and employers percent that say, I can't find people with the right skills going up every year. Well, there are only a few conclusions from that discussion and y'all can reach them, and you need to look at them. Now, today, I, I'm not one of those people, I want every child to get as much as they can get and all the opportunity. In America today, something just less than 30% of jobs need a college degree. They all need more training. Certifications, AAs, all sorts of things. But the data doesn't actually support that 70% of kids, which is the number, should go to college every fall thinking they're gonna get a degree because that leads automatically to a job. The data supports that we all ought to be lifelong learners and we ought to retrain and retrain and retrain because the jobs are going to change. When we look at all those data things that come out and say, what are the skills that everybody needs? They list, you know, there's usually 10 things on the list. Everybody says, well, you like, one of them says you need empathy and the next one says you need creativity and the third one. We think there are four things you need, but we don't think they're ordered. We think every employer we meet wants people with personal skills. They want them to be honest, they want them to have integrity, they want them to be self-motivated, they want them to be responsible. We think every employer we meet says people have to have people skills. They have to be able to communicate, work in teams, have empathy, persuasive discussions, emotional intelligence. Every employer we meet says people need thinking skills. They need to have critical thinking, they need to be adaptable, they need to be able to look at things and analyze them. And the last one they need is technical skills. Because most employers will train you how to do that, but they need to do the job they do, and they can do that on the job, they can do it through apprenticeship, they can do it through training at schools, but they need all four of those things, and if you start making a list of which one of these individual things I think is most important to train my students or my, or my teenager in, you're gonna fall short, because they need them all. Pipelines are tough things. When you talk about education pipelines, we can start with neonatal, pregnancy diversion I mean, there. I mean, how do you do a pipeline? If it's preschool, is it your nanny, your neighbor, your grandmother, you know, is it the TV? I mean, there are all sorts of places that impact kids. Five to 18, we sort of know where they're supposed to be. And how do you do that? And then post that, most kids either go to school, go to a job, go to the military, 
but then they're 25 and they've got to learn the rest of their life. So those things happen. What we're going to be report, reporting out, and you'll see more of this if you're, if you're around watching next week, is that upskilling existing workers has some role in Wisconsin for, for better short-term training. That improved career pathways are some specific things, and we talk about specific program things. One of the biggest things is work-based learning. Every one of you who's an employer in this room would tell me that you want people that have better work habits and work experience, and if they don't have any way of getting it, we're stuck again. I know the ideal world is this gentleman trains everybody and this lady steals them all a year later. I got it. <laughs> but we've got to do a better job with this. And you're, by the way, in your state is one of the leaders in apprenticeships in the country. But, and you were the first with youth apprenticeship, but there's plenty of room to improve. Career awareness for everybody is a role that the business community has to play a role in. We've got to help counselors, middle school students, parents understand where the job opportunity is going to be. We also have to reach out. The other way to expand our labor force is to find the groups that are disconnected from the labor force now. Who are they? How can we get them involved? Are they ex-offenders? Are they people that are outside the labor force for some reason in our cities? What are they? Sector strategies at the regional level. And then finally, and I think probably for the state, one of the key things is you've got to figure out how to get more people. You either have to procreate more. Help me figure that out. Those winters are long, do what you can. <laughs> but you've got to make yourself a better place for people who want to come here. So the bottom line answer on all that is just so what. This is the, that's, that's the card that's on my wall in my office, the so what question. And so what here is you've got to get this community comfortable with data. Everybody's going to want more of it. You're going to have to be able to deliver it for everybody. That data is complex, it's changing, the sources are questioned sometimes, get there, underwrite doing it. I'm sure what John's going to talk about is the idea that you've got to work together. You've got to have collective leadership that is aligned behind ideas. Group leadership's hard. We don't all like working together because we all differ in things, but you've got to find a way of doing that. When we think about dimensions of group leadership, we think it's pretty simple. You got to know what the focus is for a priority in the community. You've got to think forward, not backwards. Quite honestly, backwards doesn't help you very much. You've got to learn how to work together, and that means working with the conflict. You won't all agree. We're not going to, if we get a group in the table, if this whole table agrees on everything, then they're not going to be very innovative. And that whole table agrees on something different. The, the trick here is how do you get the two tables to do something? It's not how do you get one or the other. And how do you focus finally on getting things done? How do you manage information? How do you manage and make timely decisions? And how do you measure your progress as a community toward a goal that you've set together? Last thing, uh, over the long time I've been doing this, when people work together, I've learned eight things. The first is people, organizations, collaborate when it's in their interest to do so, period. So if you're working as a community, you've got to find what it is for everybody in the community, what they want. Where you stand always depends on where you sit. So if you want to understand why the community college is thinking about programs and why it would cost more to pay for these equipments, well, that's their world. And if you don't understand why the business doesn't want to, they want to talk about turnover, that's their world. Where you stand depends on where you sit. Collaboration is easy in times of plenty and hard in times of scarcity. Y'all are doing pretty good now, get to work. When it gets bad, it'll be harder. When the crisis exceeds the complacency, then you get better cooperation. So it gets bad, and then when you just hit bottom, it gets easy again. You can get, you get people in Detroit to work together. It's getting harder, it's getting better. People collaborate when there's a chance of success. Don't set your, set your goals as high as you can, but not too high. You've got to be able to achieve it. People collaborate when they have something specific to do. Assign people tasks. Make hold them to that, but give them stuff to do. And finally, our next one, collaborations work better when there's measurable goals. And patience is a virtue for any collaboration. You didn't get to be, plus I'll be here 100 years from now. The question is, what are you doing today that's going to imprint what it's going to look like 100 years from now? Everybody's afraid of the future. 
So I only have one thing to tell you, and if you're afraid of the future, I know the world will change. I know that you'll be carrying around, I mean, it'll be, you know, implants in my eyes pretty soon. But no matter what happens, there'll be cat videos. <laughs> and things will get good. Thank you very much. <laughs>
looking down. But I, I, I do that only to give you a rest from listening to us. And, uh, and I, I want to move beyond the high level that Ted gave at the national and state level and really talk specifically to this question of, well, what, what are we going to do about it? And the first thing I want to say about the plan that we at TIP had the privilege of working on is that it's your plan. And if at the end of my uh, 20 minutes or so, I promise not to go over, and uh, Renee, you come get me if I do, um, that if you say, well, you're not telling us anything we didn't already know or that we aren't already doing, I, I don't, I'm not offended by that at all. I want that to be the case. I want it to be the case that you look at this plan and it looks familiar to you because I don't think there's anything that we're going to talk about that you haven't already thought about or haven't worked on. So you may ask, so what was the point of spending a lot of money on a company out of uh, Austin and, and Seattle, which is where we are? And the answer is uh, to provide a framework for action. And so this is very much your plan. These are the things that you say. These are the things that are important to you. And this is about how you respond to them. So if, if I speak in generalities, you have been very good at the middle, the middle level of plans and actions. But you've lost, as Ted has pointed out, the larger context of change that's happening, that chip that will or won't be implanted in your body. And and that at the action level, at the, at the most basic level of how to get things done, there was work that remained. So by way of background, um, this is how we arrived here. It was our charge on behalf of McDevco and the Chamber to create a strategic plan for the greater Wausau region that ensured competitiveness and growth for the next 10 years with these outcomes that you see, of course, reflecting the very things that the state is concerned with. But I have some charts that take that deeper dive, only three data slides, because I know your eyes will glaze over if I have more. But this just looks at population growth for uh, the US in that dotted line that you see extending up. Uh, for Wisconsin in that purpley solid line, and then Marathon County in the city of Wausau. And, and you see why this, the same issues that Ted talked about for the state are even more pronounced for us here in Marathon County. This is a very, this is probably the most concerning slide that we could show. Um, but there's more, and I, I was not going to put these data slides in. Stacy knows that I wanted to take these out. But I wanted to find a little bit of context because, as Ted correctly says, this is how the rest of the world sees you. This is how site selectors sees you, see you. And this is how uh, millennials and Zen, Gen Z people see you as well. And what they're seeing when they look at this is that you are significantly underperforming the nation in terms of educational attainment. So not only are you not growing your population, uh, your educational levels aren't what they should be. And um, I think that one of the things that needs to be said here is that educational levels, especially four-year degree levels, are a proxy for a lot of the kind of amenities that you want. So here's the story behind that. This is the Green Bay story. And uh, we were working with Whole Foods. Whole Foods, as you know, has been acquired by Amazon, but it's an Austin-based company. It grew up in Austin, Whole Foods did. And uh, John Mackey is the CEO of uh, Whole Foods. Um, and Whole Foods was scouting a location in Green Bay. And so we were talking to the site selector and to the local developers. Whole Foods did not select Green Bay even though from an income level and a growth level, it fit the profile. But the reason that Whole Foods did not choose Green Bay was solely on the number of college-educated people as a percent of the population. Now let that sink in for a moment. 
That's a pretty disturbing, and you may say, well, what, why? why? Why would educational levels, if we have, if, we, if the people want it, and we have the income that would support it, well, at Whole Foods, like any retailer, basically says we, there's any number of communities that want us, the closest correlation to how successful we are is what your educational attainment is. So you can disagree with it. You can say Whole Foods ought not to think that way. But the point is they do. They do think that way. And, and Green Bay does not have a Whole Foods. My second home is in Bend, Oregon, a population of 80 some odd thousand people. And, and, and the total market share is under 200,000 within the entire region. We have a Whole Foods in Bend, Oregon. So that's the kind of demographic information that's, and this is to underscore Ted's point, this is the site selection part of it that you, the reality of what you're facing, the challenge that you're facing. And then finally, uh, employment, the final, final data slide, is uh, employment by industry. And that really high level in manufacturing, when manufacturing employment is declining, actually is not working in your long-term favor. You pointed out professional services as well. And professional services is one of those weird federal categories that includes software and a lot of tech jobs. And so it is an important uh, canary in the mine, if you will, of uh, declining or increasing growth. And you see your professional services there are, are uh, very low. So among the things that we learned in this plan uh, is that you have some astonishing assets. You have astonishing assets here, but they weren't immediately obvious to us. The degree to which, and I'm not going to show you all the migration data and, and commute data, but you're a true market center. And that's, that's a terrific asset. But I, I'm, I'm a bit of a sports enthusiast. I um, raced bikes in college and stayed in that industry. And so I looked for it, but I, I didn't know it was there. I didn't know it was there. I was actually buying a bicycle component off of, an, off of a, uh, a forum that uh, is a national forum, kind of an exchange, you know how those work. And, uh, and it was someone in Stevens Point that mentioned, I said I was going to be going to Wausau, it was in Stevens Point, and he said, oh, you, these events are happening this week. And I, I didn't know about them. I, had to hurt, I, I, I didn't learn them here. And so in a sense, what we felt was that a lot of what you had, you took for granted. You weren't promoting it. And the taglines and marketing that went along with it felt more like you were speaking to yourselves, not, not to the larger world. And when I discovered that there was, in fact, a tagline being promoted that said, extreme sports capital of the USA, I, I, was, I was like, my goodness, that's exactly the sort of thing. No Chamber of Commerce is going to come up with that. Awesome's tagline, if you will, came out of the bars on 6th Street, live music capital of the world. And right now, South by Southwest is going on. You're not there, and one of the reasons you may not be there is the cheapest hotel room when you're buying is $700 a night. Because we have 350,000 visitors around what originally began as being the live music capital of the world. And I'm not buying this, we're not Austin. I'm not buying it. Austin, the first time I came to Austin, a very long while ago, it was just a sleepy little college town. It was no different than Columbia, Missouri. Ho-hum. Ho-hum. Or Bend, Oregon, which is half your population and has a Whole Foods and an REI and a Trader Joe's. I'm not buying it. You have major forward-looking employers. I show a picture of Green Hex Innovation Center everywhere I go now. Incredibly forward-looking. This is a smart community with really dynamic businesses. And you have major development sites. But those risks that we talked about, those are serious risks. So what's the plan? So as I said, all of these should seem familiar to you, but we wanted 
uh, to go a little bit further with these high level goals. <coughs> we wanted to go into the kind of tactics that make them work. And y'all must be lonely over there, just so far away from the speaker. And I'm going to use this opportunity to get the water I didn't bring with me. So we have three goals in this plan. The first, predictably, and I think correctly, is talent. The second is around your innovative companies. This is red. I wonder what this is. <laughs> and the third is placement. Placement. So you heard Ted talk about placemaking already, but what, what goes into each of these? So at the next level, down from the goal, are the strategies. And the number one strategy underneath that first goal is to rebrand the Wausau region as an outdoor recreation. Now you may wonder why we would choose that, why that's the first thing you see. And it's precisely because you are losing the most critical element of your population. And don't think just millennials. Gen Z is rapidly becoming the largest cohort of the entire workforce. It already is, exceeds baby boomers. There are more Gen Z in the workforce than there are of us. And by the way, when I say us, I. I I, I mean to say not just baby boomers, and I'm a little unhappy that I, that you have a succession of white males coming up in front of you. I, I don't, I'm one of them, and I'm not entirely happy with it. Gen Z is the most diverse generation uh, in our history. And to not be mindful of the composition of your boards by race and gender and age and this tremendous mom population that you have here is not only short-sighted, this is a prescription for failure. So if you want to look at this from an action standpoint, then among the things that you can rebrand for, I no one in, in Austin, I think, would have been particularly convinced early on that being the live music capital of the world would be a good tagline. I mean, it says nothing about industry, right? The second is to actually launch a uh, new talent attraction initiative. Obviously, these things, uh, they interact with each other. And to align employer and educational partners. Now, there's more to each of these, a lot more to each of these. And I think, uh, Renee, they're going to get a copy of this as they, at the high level. But what you're getting, the copy that you're getting, is an abbreviated version of, of, a, of the much larger plan which will be available shortly after it's too much to print out. And I, I, I've learned a lot from Lori being here. I, this, is, this, is her, this is her project. That's why I say, this shouldn't be unfamiliar to you. You should look at this and say, this is what we're doing. And that's what we want this plan to be. We want it to be what you recognize and to provide more and more tactics around that. And then to grow the higher education base in the Wausau region programmatically, not just from a marketing standpoint, by having four-year degrees offered here, by having higher levels of technical skills. So when you think about talent, this is, when we show this picture in, uh, in, in Austin, it's like, oh yeah, we could know any one of those people. That's how familiar it needs to feel to you. It's how familiar a picture like this needs to feel to you. And when one of your employers, employees, says what one of our employees said, you know, I, um, I, I like to work in the, in the Seattle office because my husband is more comfortable there. When he says my husband is more comfortable here, we don't, we, we don't even shrug. You have to have that same mindset. That can't be an anomaly to you. These, Innovation and change and disruption is not just technology. It's not just technology. It's social, too. It's social. It's the fact that cannabis is becoming a major export crop from the Pacific Northwest. Unimaginable 10 years ago. Unimaginable. 
still, still hard for you to absorb, hard for me to absorb, that these are, these are major industries that are emerging, that our attitude toward the gay and lesbian community, these are social changes. And, and again, as with technology, as with the chip story, you have to get comfortable with it. You have to get comfortable with it because that's the competitive landscape that we're working in. And this is, it's just not, don't take it from me, take it from your major employers. When our governor ill-advised a uh, decision to try to push a bathroom bill through, IBM turned to him and said, if you do this, we will pull all of our facilities out of the state of Texas. Your choice. Your choice. But if you are concerned about millennials and Gen Z, then the choice is made for you. I don't want them. They have tattoos and piercings. I'm sorry. I don't, it, it's not up to us in, individually to judge that anymore if we have the competitiveness of the Wausau region on our mind. Second goal, innovative companies. We have to encourage supply chain innovation, and you have companies here who are doing that. And you have to pursue small to mid-sized recruitment targets. And you have to be comfortable with recruitment. You have to say, it's not just about people, you have to do some basic economic development work. You have to do that. And you have to do it on behalf of your major companies. Professional services is clearly one of those. And I think, Ted, you had a similar slide. The point here is not that it's automated, but that these machines are going to be smart. They're going to be smart. By that I mean they will not just do robotically what they're expected to do. They will find flaws. They will look at the sheet metal that's coming across and say that material is not to spec. It's measuring the thickness separately from the action it's performing. Machine, that's what AI is going to do, is doing, is doing. And then the third goal is placemaking. Now placemaking is both the easiest and the most difficult. And once again, there is nothing that you see here that isn't already being done. You do have a forward-looking city. You have incredibly forward-looking institutions. But they've been working in a very siloed way, despite their best efforts. And you need to accelerate the pace of urban revitalization and mixed-use development. You have to do that. You have to do that. You have to pursue long-term redevelopment options for the Wausau Center Mall. And you have to extend and reach the reach of fiber and ensure 5G connectivity. So let, let me tell you about this with another example. Now, this, what you're looking at there is in Kenosha, Wisconsin. You all know Kenosha. Uh, the background of this, this is the deck of Common Grounds Coffee Shop. Have any of you been to Common Grounds in Kenosha? So uh, maybe 15 years ago, we were working in Kenosha, and uh, I, I needed a cup of coffee, as I so often do. And uh, right near the downtown, right across from the Kaba offices, Kenosha Area Business Alliance, was a little coffee shop called Common Grounds. Um, I ordered my coffee while they were making it. I asked uh, where the restroom was, and I walked the length of this coffee shop to the restroom went into it, and there was a window in the restroom, and there was the lake. And it was a beautiful day, and I'm not looking at the lake. <coughs> so I come back, and the, the woman, the proprietor, uh, and I said, God, this is, this, thanks for the coffee, this is really beautiful out there. Have you ever thought about putting a deck out there? She blew up at me. Coffee blew up at me. She said, I've been struggling with the city for two years to get a deck permit. <laughs> and I can't do it. And I said, what? And I went back and talked to Todd, and I said, what's the backstory to all of this? The backstory was, I don't know, in 1930s, there was some 
fight in a bar on <laughs> you know, and it was because there were outside tables and the city passed an ordinance and no no more outdoor I don't know. And I just reached out to Bobby just before I came down here about this. The other Kenosha story was uh, Jockey. Got to know the CEO of Jockey uh, pretty well. And uh, Jockey had an outlet store. And it was out way, it was way out in like the suburb somewhere. And I don't know why I was looking for the, I think I had not packed enough underwear or something. So I, I went to the Jockey outlet store. It's like way out at the edge of the city. And uh, I came back and I met with the CEO of Jockey and I said, if we put something meaningful together here about relocating the outlet store into the downtown, I said, I don't want to make that recommendation unless you're amenable to it. And he said, sure, put the right pro forma together and we'll do it. So go to Kenosha, go downtown, Go to the Chalky Outlet Store, and the Kappa offices are now right above that in a very <coughs> cool space. That's tactical. That's the way in which these things get done. So those are real examples. You can talk to Bobby and Todd, and, and Tim Tebow opened that store, by the way. So that's, that's what makes this work, and you have it. You have it. Y'all know this building? So, John Karras, who, um, by the way, got poached away from us. Uh, those of you who worked with him on the project, I, I couldn't keep him because the pay scale that he was being offered, we, could, we, could, we were willing to match it, but we would have had to match it for all of our other employees. It would have been too difficult. So, Dave is walking John Karras and me along the riverfront, not on a day like this. <laughs> and we and he's telling us about the whitewater kayaking and and I, I'm really impressed. Again, things I didn't know. It's a story you only tell yourself, so you need to be telling us. And we come upon this building, and I'm like, oh my goodness, that is beautiful. That is iconic. It's an iconic building. And we it was of course it's shuttered. Clark's Island building is what it's sometimes referred to in the electric. Building. Slated for demolition. Slated for demolition. Not all right. Not all right. And to WPS's great credit, there's now a six-month extension on that. And I've already volunteered, and I'm committing myself publicly here, that, that though our contract is over, I guess today, uh, we're, we're going to continue this work pro bono to put a pro forma together to make this work. You can't lose. can't lose a building like this. And so what do you do with a building like this? Well, you do things like co-working. Co-working space, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is, is more than just a cool idea that WeWork came up with in New York, which is basically shared. It, it's the same sharing economy that's such a powerful trend right now. It's a way, it's a collaborative space, and, and specific to another project in Green Bay, where Paul Belcher put in a co-working space, before it was completed, right, right next to the chamber uh, offices in downtown, uh, initial build-out was about the same, about 12,000 square feet, fully leased before, it was com before the renovations were complete. Fully leased. And not just by uh, you, your on, entrepreneurial kinds of efforts, but by existing companies who didn't have a place to put their employ their uh, contractors when they were visiting Green Bay. Well, could that be true of Wasan? Well, it's not only true; it's sad and true. East Bay had to put one of their uh, contractors. Not making this up. Why could I? Why, how could I, why would I, uh, in a senior center. So when you're putting up a 35-year-old man from New York in a senior center, eh, 
maybe not the ideal situation. <laughs> that story has a lot of dimensions. But having a place to work like this in those 12,000 square feet, which, by the way, has a boat ramp, I mean, a kayak ramp, right at the river, you cannot lose this building. And, and not only that, I've actually, in Austin, I met with, with White Construction and with, uh, with, uh, with a design firm that, that just volunteered to help me. And the point here is that you have friends and people that would care about you because they care about these things. You're not alone in the world. And you mentioned quality of life as one of those indicators that's rapidly moved up. We prefer to talk about quality of place. And you may say, well, what's the difference between quality of life and quality of place. Well, the difference is, all, everyone, we go to, like Ted, we go to hundreds of communities across the country, hundreds of them. Everyone has the best quality of life. Every one of them says that and believes it. And you know what, they're right. They're right. They're right because why wouldn't you believe that if you lived there? The, the difference between quality of life and quality of place is that quality of place takes into consideration what you look like to someone who's not You can't keep talking to yourselves. Collaboration cannot be a closed loop. The fact that people in Austin, Texas now care about this building is evidence of it. We may not be able to save it, but the concept behind it encourages us to say what the city has already been saying. You need to develop that riverfront. You absolutely need to do it. It's such an astonishing asset. And the cities that we can tick off, and I, I could go on the rest of my time just ticking off cities that have made major riverfront redevelopment. You know, Ted, you know that Greenville, South Carolina, you know that Reno, Nevada, Bend, Oregon, Austin, Texas, on and on and on, small, large, they all recognize that the vibrancy of the river is a major attractor to millennials and Gen Z. And, the, and this anchors it. Finally, we are putting a lot of emphasis on 5G and connectivity, including rural connectivity. And by the way, what, when, is, when is my time up, Renee? Remind me. So, uh, so this year, these couple of anniversaries, uh, one of them is 10 years out from the recession, major restructuring from the recession. Those of you who don't remember it uh, are, are wise to look back on it and reflect uh, what a devastating period that was and how there was a reset as a result. There was a reset of the economy. And that reset was the chart that Ted showed where productivity growth and employment growth started to really diverge. And it's, it is the, I, I gave a talk at, at the Google headquarters uh, recently and the number one concern of their employees was social equity issues arising from and out of the recession. In other words, everyone that's doing well from the, from the end of the recession to now is highly educated and highly compensated, and all the other job growth is all low wage. And you know this, you read this in the paper every day, it's the shrinking middle class. The virtual disappearance of middle skill. It's a problem. So what does it mean to be competitive? Well, the other anniversary, actually this week, is the uh, 30th anniversary of the internet. So those of you who think back 1989, in 1989 you were not surfing the web. There was no web. <laughs> now there is. And 5G, and I, I'm overstating it just a little but not a lot, the impact of 5G may be roughly comparable to the emergence of the World Wide Web. Does that impress you? It should. In other words, it's as big an introduction of 5G is potentially as big a deal as the creation of the internet. So when I say creation of the internet, it's literally when the protocols, the URLs and the www, all that, it's 19, nothing before 1989. And then from 1989, in these 30 years, in one generation roughly, transformative. Everything's transformed. 
And so I'm saying 5G has that same potential. Why? Why am I saying that? 5G is just speed. It's just fifth generation speed. But with it come astonishing changes. Number one is the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is basically the fact that the way that we think of the Internet, our access to it, the portals, the cloud computing, all of that. And remember, cloud computing, there's no cloud, right? I mean, cloud computing is just a bunch of servers in, in buildings. That's what the cloud is. But we're going to move slowly away from that because IoT, the Internet of Things, is going to enable it. And basically what it means is that things will talk to each other. Things will talk to each other. Things will talk to each other. And the things that talk to each other are everything from cars. I mean, it's still amazing to me that I have to pull out of the parking lot here, adjacent to the, in the mall, and I have to sit for a light when nothing's coming. We've all experienced it. It's all like, oh, well, yeah. Sometimes it's really annoying. Why? Why are we doing that? Because, and we will look back at this silly question like that and say, yeah, you know what? That is something that we won't have anymore with IoT. Cars will talk to stoplights. Cars will talk. There will be no more car accidents. So in five years, I, I think we can safely predict there will be no more car accidents. Nice, isn't it? And that's completely separate. When we look at the future, we almost always look at the wrong thing. We're all excited about whether or not there will be driverless cars. It doesn't matter whether there's a driver in the car or whether you're behind the wheel. What matters is you don't have an accident. What matters is that when you fall asleep at the wheel, you don't crash into the bridge embankment, that you don't back over your neighbor's cat. IoT enables all of that. And this is not futurist stuff. I'm not a futurist. I don't want to be a futurist. I'm only telling you what is already here. This is what is already here. This is not tomorrow. This is already here. The deployment of it will be uneven. And you said, you said something very similar. The deployment will be uneven. And the communities that move rapidly into 5G, and you get to 5G, just when are you going to get there? So we are saying that the city and the county need a 5G strategy. So that's, that's why I think this is all so incredibly important. So I want to spend the last four minutes. I tend to be punctual. I'm getting the signal. <laughs> <laughs> that we were left, when we finished the plan, which you'll see, I mean, you'll see at the high level, you won't see all the details, that comes later. We had to ask ourselves the question, are we in Wausau structured in a way that helps ensure success? In other words, do you have the capacity uh, to meet these goals in the plan? The answer is, no, you're not. You're not. So out of that emerged a recommendation for the creation of the, something we are provisionally, you, you all can name it anything you want, we thought this would be a good name, the Greater Wausau Prosperity Partnership. We think that's necessary. We think it's necessary because Jim McIntyre goes to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the response from an economic development perspective is unambiguous. It's unambiguous. It's highly focused. It meets his needs and then some, and it fits within a framework that the community has committed to. And Tulsa is no more special than you are. But they had that. They had that point of contact. They had economic development as a top priority. I'm done. <laughs> I really appreciated this, by the way. Let me say, let me end by saying, and we will, we'll, I think the panel will talk about the Greater Wausau Partnership, right, Dave? Uh, so we'll get into all the details. But I just want to say it's been an honor and a privilege uh, to work here. Uh, it, this is an amazing community, an incredible number of smart people. There are amazing initiatives already out there, and, and the sad part of that is you may not have even known about those initiatives. You didn't know that some of the things that we find possible are indeed possible, and we see the very brightest future for the Greater Wausau Prosperity Partnership. Thank you very much.
Well, uh, thank you, John. And before you go too far there, I got yeah, to tether, uh, but uh, today uh, is John's birthday. Oh. So, uh, John, on behalf of the greater Wausau area, uh, Dave here has a little gift for you on your birthday. Thank you. And a token of appreciation. You're a good friend. You will be. Uh, talk to a lot. Um, this is a token. Um, and I, and this, is, this is meaningful in a few ways because it's about us. Um, it's about tradition. And it's about you coming here when you got 17 inches of snow and you dressed appropriately. <laughs> you have a hat. Thank you very much. <laughs> So this is local, right? It's part of it's made local, yep. This is terrific. This is awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and welcome our executive panelists to the stage. Uh, first, we have Matt Haywood, the president and CEO of Aspirus. Matt? Next, we have Brad Carger, our county administrator. Next is Jim McIntyre, the CEO of Greenock. Last but not least, Dr. Lori Wires, president of North Central Technical College. certainly have seen uh, the, the plan in more detail, and they have great perspective on where we need to go as a community. So we'll go through, and there'll be time for questions and answers at the end, uh, but we have uh, several questions we want to get to to get their perspective. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Wires and Brad. Uh, each of you have been involved with the creation of the Greater Wausau Economic Development Strategic Plan from the start. Thinking back to where this project began, uh, to where we are today, what are you most excited about and, and how the plan has been unveiled. I'm starting, correct? Yeah. Well, many of you that know me, I'm excited all the time. So um, <laughs> just to give you a flavor, NTC is very honored to be here on the panel today. And I think one of the things that I've learned with this community, is I came here 12 years ago, is the commitment to working together, collaboration, and relationships. And I see this plan taking us to the next step. Um, I think it is a clear roadmap of what we have to do. I also was very excited that it aligns totally with the strategies that North Central Technical College has put in place. And some of those things I'll just share with you that will align closely to the directions that we need to go. Um, re related to talent, NTC views that as a critical role that we play in our community. We also feel that to keep the talent here, we have to have the resources to continue to upgrade their skills so that it keeps our businesses competitive. We're very proud of our business and industry solutions team that has salespeople that directly work with individual businesses. Last year, we served 900 companies and over 10,000 employees. So we understand the importance of working with our fellow colleagues and making sure that we keep that strong. When I came to NTC, we look at where does our pipeline come from? What do we need to do with career pathways? We're very proud of our partnerships with K-12 we currently have students that are enrolled in college courses at NTC while they're in high school. We served over, we granted over 11,000 college credits to high school students, and over 3,000 students have participated. Of that, we're finding that about five, six years ago, uh, the NTC uh, network in our college only had 14% of high school students staying in our region and coming to NTC. We thought we have to look at how we keep that talent here. So we went about having a division that totally works on, on our K-12 activities. We have career coaches in high school. We have a middle school career coach. We now look at a percentage, and right now, NTC is getting 50% of the share of K-12 individuals staying in our district. 
We've added Timberwolf Suites, which allows people to come from outside of our district. We know we have a declining high school population. 20% of our students now come out of district. The reason is we've looked at unique niches that we provide that no one else in the state does. We have a public safety center of excellence uh, in Merrill, and it serves the entire DNR ward and population. We do all the training for the state of Wisconsin. Guess where they stay? In our hotels, eat at our restaurants, and they get gas at our gas stations. So we view that talent when people come here that we want them to continue to look at staying here. We view ourselves as an educational hub. I don't know if all of you know, but we have seamless completion junior status to baccalaureate institutions. We work right now with UW Oshkosh, UW Green Bay, our friends at UW Stevens Point. We work with private college and universities. We have Michigan Tech. We have Stout. We have all these universities that are on campus working with our students to keep the talent here. We also view that diversity and having a broader perspective of the students we serve is very important to us. In our college, we have a diverse staff, our advisors, go across all ethnicity, and we really are working very diligently with the Among Americans Fund. We are the gold premier sponsor for the Dream Conference. We work very closely with the Abbotsford community. 32% of their K-12 are Hispanic. We are really making efforts to keep, again, that workforce here. A real exciting venture that really aligns to this plan is with the Extreme Sports Initiative. We are moving forward with an initiative that our Dr. Jean Wharton is sitting over there, and as your chair of the chamber is leading that initiative with our VP uh, of learning, is eSports. It is a major sporting activity in major university and colleges. It's around the IT area, and we are going to join the league for eSports. We'll be competing with universities like Miami, Ohio, Stanford, other universities. It's big business. We're bringing in a focus group of middle school kids, and they're going to design our extreme sports uh, technology. We're going to have play, uh, have the state of the art equipment. Why are we doing that? Because we want those kids to stay here. We want them to train here and be in their businesses. And then finally, I just want to again stress to you that I view myself as businesses president. All right, I really view that we will not be successful without people right here. We worked, we worked with, um, on our advisory committees, we have over 432 companies, 900 individuals that advise us every day on what we want to do. Our other initiatives that we're working on right now is hospitality tourism, which fits into this, sports management, which fits into our plan. We'll have a new restaurant for our culinary program starting in the fall. Uh, we're looking at having all the engineering programs, civil, mechanic, electrical and manufacturing. Civil will be the next one we're doing. And we have a virtual college that is number two online best college in the country. Little NTC. We are nationally known for online learning. We're very proud of that. And on that, leading to the plan as well as logistics and supply chain management, cybersecurity, which will be a new program for us. We have foundations of teacher education where our early childhood education students will be able to continue on into elementary education. We have a partnership with Marion University where our tech ed students can take additional courses. They can do their practice teaching in our high schools and we now will have a pool of tech ed instructors. Last year we graduated two in the state. It's time to change that if we're gonna support manufacturing our technical areas and we are poised and ready to do that. We're very excited about this. And we view at MTC that we are nimble, we are flexible, and we're 24 7. Thank you. <laughs> I have to follow up. I've done it many times, though, so I might not. Okay. Um, what, what interests me most about this plan is, a, is the opportunity for a new government business partnership. For the 30 plus years that I've been involved with Marathon County, the elected officials of our county were reported back that what business officials, when they talk to them, what they want is lower taxes. Okay, and I think there's an opportunity now here to say what we want are strategic investments and that we're going to bring our resources to the table in cooperation in a new partnership where we're thinking long term not just a, a strategy for going out of business and doing less of everything, but really starting to think about what are the financial resources, what are the other resources that government can bring, what are the requests of us, and what is the partnership going to look like? Thank you. 
Brian, we're going to stay with you. Uh, Dr. Wires, you mentioned your virtual school as being one of the top schools uh, in the nation. Uh, Matt, you're developing a digital front door with Spirus to expand your reach in our communities. Jim, I'm sure there's a strategy in there. I'm not as familiar with it, but I'm sure there is one. Uh, Brad, can you talk about the role of county government uh, in the broadband expansion? John talked a lot about that five right. expansion. Can you talk about what the county's role? Broadband is critical to our success in the future, and, and on behalf of our, our Marathon County team, we're in a good place right now. We got this. Uh, we have now hired a new position to shepherd the broadband uh, initiative. They will be working at the University, or the University of Wisconsin Extension, now partnered with UW-Madison. And that will be her main responsibility. Uh, we will have already drafted an RFP to get a consultant to look at what it would take to bring broadband to all of the Marathon County, not just the rural area, because by the time you get done with the rural area, the urban area will not be fast enough, will not be high tech enough. And that report will be done by the end of the year, but the needs for investment for next year, both on the part of the county and business community, uh, will be done in time for our budget process, so it will be done by Labor Day. So I think we're really in a strong position. We anticipated this. It's been a part of our top priority of our strategic plan, and, and uh, we're ready to implement it. Okay. Turning now to you, Jim. Uh, the second strategy in the plan is around innovative companies and their growth and attraction to the region. Can you speak? to what it would mean to Green Hack to bring innovative companies closer into your supply chain and help the audience understand the importance of tech growth and entrepreneurship to you and our region. Thank you. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, is, it, is it on? No, no, no. no. no I think it's oh, yeah, We'll take this one. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Good morning, everyone. So this whole notion of uh, innovation and collaboration, really the focus there to a company like ours uh, is a focus on the future in terms of the disruptions that could occur to a company like ours. Without that supply chain uh, involved, we, we, we are exposed, and I think our, our businesses in this community are exposed as well. So the more that we can have a collaborative supply chain, whether it's on the technology side, or we're working heavily on composites right now. One of our uh, chief engineers is working with the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison and other companies to help us look at composites that are gonna come into our space and compete with us and potentially disrupt our organization. So getting ahead of that curve from a company like ours is really important and having the supply chain involved in that uh, would be very, very helpful, and I think crucial to many of our manufacturers and other companies in this community. Matt, turning now to you. Uh, the third goal of the plan is placemaking. Uh, it focuses on riverfront development uh, between the Thomas and Scott Street bridges, uh, the reimagining of the Wassa Center Mall, and new market rate housing development. Let's start with you describing uh, the decision for Aspirus to move a clinic downtown in a partnership with the YMCA and how that might be linked to these strategies. Uh, Aspirus strongly believes, and, and I personally believe, in the placemaking concept. I, I believe if you have uh, a vibrant local area that can attract people and they can mingle and interact, it's what people are looking for today. And when you go out to a lot of the communities you heard about, that's been a big foundation. I also believe that the riverfronts and a lot of the places I've lived, I've been in a lot of places in the country, a lot of them are small towns trying to make themselves revitalize, et cetera, and they've gone back to what used to be industrial centers and tried to revitalize them. So I see and I think Aspire saw great opportunity in the placemaking concept. And we already have a great start downtown. When I first came here, that was a thing that attracted me, that I could come downtown with a lot of uh, action and things like the uh, Grand Theater, there's a lot of arts and culture, uh, but what I see is that we have pockets of opportunity, and so one of the things we wanted to do is Aspirus views itself not as a place you go to when you're sick, but as a healthcare entity, and a healthcare entity means how do we help you when you're healthy and when you're sick. So we decided to start some of that place making concept and help push uh, the downtown further along that journey and the Y was looking to expand and originally the Y's expansion was a small couple million dollar, how do we fix the gym, how do we fix the daycare and I give a lot of the members of the Y Foundation and the board and that group uh, a lot of credit that we all sat and said no, how do we make it more than that? How do we make it a destination 
Um, again, building on that um, health, wellness concept that you heard uh, in the presentation. So we said, how do we make it more than that? And we decided as we started looking at it, how do we bring a clinic downtown? How do we tie it to uh, the Y? How do we make the Y expansion fit the needs of the community? Not just daycare, not just gym, but the aging population. I was, by the way, one of the individuals when he first came down here had to stay in a senior citizen's um, uh, place in order to find housing temporarily. So we started asking ourselves, how do we start to deal with as we age? But also, how do we create a vibrant local area with for the younger generation as well? So we started to re-envision the Y, and now, as you all know, it's over a $40 million project. About 20 million of it's the uh, Spirits, and about 20 million is the Y. We got huge outpouring from the community, a huge outpouring from people to help fund it, and now we have a senior center that they're envisioning. We have the gym expansion for an indoor track. We have um, uh, uh, expansions beyond the just gymnastics and the daycare. And I think we're gonna have a really strong health and wellness hub that's a good foundation, I think, and start for uh, the downtown. And we're hoping that that will help springboard the expansion of a uh, second maybe tower, maybe further revitalizing the downtown riverfront, and hopefully giving that another kickstart and getting that going. So we're excited for it. It's a great project. Real, real quickly, uh, one of the core strategies at the beginning of the plan is this idea of a you know, recreation mechanism. Would each of you just real quickly comment on your uh, feelings towards that? What does that speak to you? And how do you feel about that rebranding of the area? I'll start since I have the mic and hand that's an idea. Um, again, we, we talked about being a health and wellness company instead of just a sick company. We said that we do have a strong, healthy, vibrant community. One of the things when you ask people when you're recruiting, when you ask people why they stay, you ask people why they come and visit, it is a strong foundation to our community. We've got a lot of great resources and assets here. So how do we build on it? How do we leverage it? And so we, I think it's a great foundation. Also, I, I believe when you want to create something that's going to take a lot of people with different opinions to come together, picking something that is a good foundation we all believe in, that's why we're here, will be a great start for us to build off of. And that will be something we believe in so strongly that it will exude out when people come and when they see it, they see us enjoying it, they see us believing it, they see us talking about it. That will build momentum, I think, to build and bring other people in. So I do think it's a good, solid, neutral foundation we all can get behind and support. So I think that will be something to make it successful. I agree with a lot what Matt said, but uh, you know we already have to recognize that we're already down terrific in terms of sports tourism. The last 10 years, that's really been all the growth in tourism here in Marathon County. It's really what we have. We're not going to have the lakes. We're not going to compete with Monaco and stuff like that. But we are in the center of the state, and we do have some sports facilities. But I don't want people to be naive. If we're going to go to the next level, we have to upgrade those facilities. We're going to have to invest in that. We're really talking about being a sports mecca. We're going to have to have a new hockey arena. We're going to have to have, have things that, are, that uh, accommodate big events. And, uh, and heck, we can have them, you know, this sun, summer season isn't all that long here. <laughs> and uh, there are going to have to be multiple things going on in multiple places, like we do on the, the weekend, and we have the balloon rally, and the art fest, and the softball. So we're going to have to, we're going to, have to say, OK, this is a priority, and we're going to have to invest in it. It's not just going to happen. Uh, two thoughts on, on this. First of all, you know, if I look at it from a business perspective or a marketing perspective, you always want to lean into your strengths. And this is one of our strengths in this community that I think we can all rally around if that's what we decide to do. Uh, the, the importance there is to pick something and do, do it extraordinarily well, as opposed to trying to do some many things and you, you end up doing them poorly. Secondly, uh, so in our organization right now, we are targeting uh, bringing in uh, engineers and other uh, uh, graduates of four-year uh, schools into our community. And we've, we've re-energized a lot of our focus there over the last five years. And our team has done a really good job. Our, our, our HR folks have done a really nice job of that. And when we bring them in, 
Um, we bring them into either a rotating type program where they get exposure to a lot of different opportunities within our organization over a two year period and then they choose what field they want to go into or they come in and they're really specific, they're specific to a particular trade. But regardless of, uh, of which track they choose to, to select, once they come on board, they're very excited to join our organization. The, when John met with this group at Wausau, the, the, the problem that they had with the, the community is the networking opportunities outside of the network within uh, the group. So this focus on millennials, I think, is going to really be a challenge for us to, to think deeply about that. I do believe something like uh, the sports focus could bring that group together, not just from our organization, obviously, but from all of our organizations to tie them to a, a much larger network in our community and focus on some of the things that will make us different. And I think there will be significant investment. Uh, it'll require a vision. It'll require some choices of what we're not going to do and what we are going to do, and a significant contribution from all of us to, to make it work. Well, our role, obviously, is to complement what our businesses and our community wish to do. I think it has much potential. I agree with Jim that we have to focus and select certain areas and do it well and not try to do everything. Um, one of the things we want to complement with that is we're really into health and wellness within our programs. Uh, we, only, we have the only working uh, farm in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we're, now, we're now dovetailing with our culinary program where we have food huts with growing the vegetables, healthy living, healthy recipes. We're offering continuing ed to our community to complement what we're trying to do at the Y and what Aspirus is doing. To, again, looking at what's happening in the community. I have two sons. Uh, both of them come here because they like the outdoor and the opportunities here. My one son is a firefighter and he's an assistant fire chief in, in Appleton. He loves coming here. Uh, he's very close friends with Tracy. He really loves the outdoor things. He's a, a kayaker, he's a bike rider, etc., etc. His son that lives in California uh, and works in the entertainment industry. He loves coming here just because of the things that are going on in Wausau. So I think we have a real opportunity here And talking to my sons who are in the age where they have a lot of things to contribute. I think we have a great opportunity. I think we're all poised to join together. And I also agree with Brad that we're going to have to make an investment I think we could be a place where we have a lot of basketball, hockey, softball, different kinds of tournaments. People like coming here because it's pristine, it's beautiful. Uh, we have a lot of local culture. So I certainly uh, support what's being said and I uh, think we could do a good job if we all work together on this. Thank you all. So in the report I was struck that 18% of Wausau falls below the poverty line. A lot of people might know that, but the number stood out to me because I know there's a huge employment demand in our community and there are a lot of high paying or better paying jobs that are available. So Dr. Wires, NTC does a great job connecting with businesses needs. You've highlighted some of those. You've been truly innovative over the years. Uh, how can businesses further leverage higher education uh, to draw talent not only from outside the area, but also this segment of the community by linking skills development to personal economic opportunities that exist? Well, that's a tough question. Uh, but one of the things that I want to bring up is I think we have some wonderful opportunities here in really bridging that and looking at how we can keep uh, our individuals here. And we deal with a lot of students who are economically disadvantaged at our, our, at our college. But I'd, I'd like to talk about an opportunity we have that I don't think we have totally tapped in order to move that that spectrum and support economic development. We have the opportunity with our friends from UWSP to do something very unique that we have not done in the past. Uh, we now are, have a UWS Stevens Point Wausau campus um, very closely linked to what NTC can do. So we have an opportunity here that we can turn that around and really impact the economic development. We could have an impact on baccalaureate completion. NTC, as I shared with you before, has 50% of that senior market within three years of graduation. We focus on that first two years. UWSP and, and NTC are talking about that baccalaureate completion, which, as you saw all the reports, will have an impact on economic development. And what we need to do right now is look at that niche that UWSP can have. And NTC could be a very good partner. We're trying to be a very good partner. My friend Chancellor Patterson and I have been doing a lot of talking about that. 
It would allow us to get at the poverty level students because they are not going to leave the area. Many of them are location bound. We have an opportunity to expand here. We're talking right now about business programs. We have a nursing program. These are high demand occupations. We can do that first two years. And I know that, uh, Chancellor Patterson wants to look at that baccalaureate completion. Don't duplicate effort. We have a, a decline of 23% in our seniors in high school. We need to look at how we complement each other. And that's what we need to do if we want to make a change in economic development. We have to make that shift in how we view UWSP and MTC. That has to change. Another thing that we look at, our virtual college, reminder, number two in the nation, we're in 34 states and six other countries. I have offered to UWSP to be our, our preferred baccalaureate completion on virtual college. We have, we have developed the whole learning management system. We'll train the people. We'll help with that, with the faculty. We have faculty that are well versed in doing it. Just think about the impact that we could have on people and companies that are, that are international like Greenham if we teamed up on that. And that's what I think we have to do. I also think that we have a great partnership with Greenham. We're a strategic partner. We are now working with them with Towson Tech. We're trying to help that community, and we're doing some of the training for all of it. That brings people here, that gets them again looking at our region. And in addition, you know, some of the barriers that we face in making this leap. And, and sometimes NTC is viewed as, well, you can't go anywhere else, go to NTC. When I came here 12 years ago, the perceptions and the image of our college saddened me. We went around and talked to all the people in the community, parents and everything, you know what I heard? Great, or, great institution, but not for my kid. That has to change, it has changed. Every single one of our programs transfers junior status to major universities. Our nursing program transfers to Purdue junior status. We have to change an image, we have to understand that the technical college system and the University of Wisconsin system have to be aligned, and that's the direction we're going. But all of you can make a difference. If you look at your technical college as a viable first choice, as a viable member of this community, I think in the last 12 years, we have had a total impact on changing that, and we need your help to continue. With the poverty level, 76% of our students have, are, are living in economic disadvantaged times. In the budget request, we have had in 20 years a 1.5 million increase only in financial aid in 20 years in the technical college system. Last year, we had to turn away 1,550 full-time students who want to go into manufacturing, who want to go into healthcare, who want to do things because there's no Wisconsin grant dollars left. We have made a request in this year's budget to change that. So if we want economic development, we want diverse candidates, we want people who are facing poverty, we need to change that and provide resources up front to help them have a better quality of life. And that's what we need to do to change the economic impact in our community. Matt and Jim will come back to you both. Uh, according to the report, the Wausau region's employment base has yet to recover fully from the Great Recession. We are currently at 3% unemployment, and talent remains the major issue facing the community and our businesses. Since 2008, manufacturing has had a negative net loss of jobs of approximately 13,000 jobs in our area. Uh, education and government have remained relatively flat, and healthcare has added 1,200 jobs here in our region. Can each of you speak to the changes in jobs in each of your industries, and where you expect it to go in the next few years? Yes, uh, so in our organization, we are seeing, uh, again, a lot more collaboration across the diff different disciplines. Uh, I'll give you another example. So uh, a few years back, we, we have a strong information technology team, but we knew that we were lacking in the area of digital commerce and digi the whole digital transformation. So we actually um, made, we, we, we went out and made an investment in a, in a team. They're now our employees, but the leader of that group is in Seattle. Uh, his right-hand person is in Sacramento. They have a person in Chicago, another one person in uh, New York, and then uh, a whole cast of characters in India that are supporting them. None of them work here, yet there are employees all in these remote locations. So as we think about that from an organizational standpoint, that worked for us, but it doesn't really work for the community. 
the more that we can bring that talent into our community that we can share across all of our industries, again, whether it's technology or composites, uh, we will upgrade that, that whole workforce. So there's more collaboration necessary across the fields. Uh, the whole notion, there was a, this the, the, the field up there called data analytics, and I know Stevens Point, University of Wisconsin Stevens Point is focused on that heavily. That leading into this whole artificial intelligence, uh, the whole composites, technology, driving all of that together, those fields together, working together, is how we're going to change the, I think, a, a real opportunity for us to change that in our community. So working together across more disciplines, bringing that talent here to our local community to help all of our industry. Uh, as for healthcare in general, and then Aspire specifically, healthcare you could argue is a growing industry from the fact that everybody's aging. However, we are facing many of the same challenges everybody else is with regards to the fact that while everybody's aging, people are figuring out how to live healthier lives and figuring out how to get many of those procedures in different ways and medications are keeping people healthier. So we can't assume that growth is in the healthcare future from the perspective of the traditional model of caring for people when they're sick. Uh, so first and foremost, we have to realize that as in discussion today, don't take for granted that healthcare is growing 1,200 jobs, that it's going to continue to grow at that rate because of all those counters to making sure people stay healthier, which is what we want. Uh, so I would want to say that the fact we've had exponential growth is not something that A, take for granted. B, realize the reason we've had that exponential growth uh, I can speak for Aspirus. I would say that probably in the last five years, we quickly, before I came, did a quick high-level assessment just in Wausau. We doubled in size as Aspirus throughout northern Wisconsin for 25,000 square miles in the last five years, and we've added over five to 600 jobs just in Wausau proper. And each of those jobs generates over $250,000 downstream funding. So just those 600 jobs is almost 130 to $150 million in the community. So those individuals are providing a lot to the community, but I want to make it clear that it's not something we should take for granted. We're not a business. Just because we live here, we take care of people here, we need people to take care of people, we have to realize that the healthcare industry is not something we take for granted and that it's an industry that's just always going to be there. And the reason I bring that up is the reason we're able to grow as rapidly as we are is because the community here has the ability to provide the resources, the 5G interconnectivity for us is huge. As healthcare becomes more IT focused, we want to monitor you in your house. We want to read and send digital images. Sending x-rays, sending CT scans takes huge bandwidth. So if we don't have those right resources, there's parts of our business that could move out of Wausau to do those jobs remotely that we don't want to have happen. So again, I'm just I keep po focusing on healthcare is not something to take for granted. It's going to be something that we need the same level of resources that we were talking about. If we do a good job, though, I think we can continue to grow as an industry in this market and offer opportunity. Then that leads me to my final point. Growth is dependent not just on a building that gets built, not just on the fact we have 5G connectivity. We need the people. We need the people that have the skills to do a very highly technical job. And we got to partner with our local education. We've done a great job, not just with NTC, not just with UW Stevens Point, but with MCW, with our uh, educational program to help educate physicians in the local community. So we got to keep that effort, and then we got to have a community that's strong enough to bring people in from a very diverse background. If you look at healthcare, healthcare probably on average is recruiting very diverse individuals from all over the country and the world, and we're trying to compete with everybody else because those are the most fungible jobs when it comes, I know there's a lot of other fungible jobs, but there's healthcare, you could be a nurse, you could be a doctor, anywhere in the country. There's not pockets of expertise, it's everywhere. So we're competing with everywhere in the country. Uh, for those resources. So we need to have a community and when those people come, they see a difference that they want to um, come here and experience. And ultimately, you've got to have a company, so we all have to work to make sure our organizations are places that people want to come to, not just the communities. And so if we can do those things, I think we can continue to hopefully be a strong contributor and a strong foundation for um, the loss on the, 
for the Wisconsin market. Thank you. We'll, we'll go ahead and stick with Jim and Matt on this next question. So I heard high skilled jobs are difficult to find and fill uh, in our region. And if you look at the report, in the report it says that our low and middle skilled jobs have relatively kept wage growth uh, pace with national trends. However, high skilled jobs have not. Uh, we, there's a decrement there that we're not keeping pace. And I, the question I have for you is, is it as simple as matching the wage rates for those jobs to draw people in, or is there something more that is incumbent in that strategy? I would say from uh, at least the healthcare perspective, our wage rates, we keep track of them. Our wage rates are keeping up with the rest of the country. In fact, our wage rates are keeping up with the rest of the country when our cost of living is dramatically lower. Um, so the only area you might see a difference in wage rate um, would be if you get to New York City or California, but you start looking at, and I do it for a lot of our staff, and, and we look at our various roles, we're competing with a nurse in Dallas, Texas, that has a whole different cost of living than us here, and we're still having to compete with that wage rate. Um, and today the world is changing where uh, the wage rates are becoming more, at least in healthcare, more obviously matched throughout the country. Back to mind, we're pulling from everywhere and everybody's competing everywhere. Uh, so your community and the fact your community has got a lower cost of living, it's got more things that attract you, can help add to that cost of uh, the calculation in the person's mind that, hey, I'm getting the same wage, but I don't have to drive. So we've actually recruited people from Seattle and that area, they drive literally an hour and a half to work each day. Some two hours every day to work, back and forth. That's one way, by the way. Two hours one way, two hours back. So we can get the talent because they don't have to drive that. But they've got to feel that there's something for it. But they're still going to want close to that same wage rate because they can go anywhere in the country. So fighting on wage rate is something we can do. And I know I, I could say I'm as far as we have, we are doing that. But that's not going to win the day. What's going to win the day is the community, the culture, the things people can do, and your organization. Our improvement in hiring has happened because of a lot of the work the community's done and a lot of work we've done to make it a great place where people want to be and sell these attributes that we're talking about. So when you're talking to somebody who has a two-hour each-way community, you can sell all the great things, get them to meet people in the community, get them to meet people in the organization, and they walk away wanting to come. Our statistics would, uh, within our organization, would, would refute that uh, for sure. Uh, we will not be a competitive organization if we don't bring of the best talent to the table and to com we're competing not in this community we're competing uh, across many states so uh, having said that so we're, we're competitive there but i uh, the, the employees that we're bringing in uh similar to what matt says it's more than the, than the salary you've got to be competitive there that's those are the table stakes it's the culture within that organization that will be most attractive uh, and once you bring them in, you've got to have a community that, again, surrounds those newer, newer employees in that community and makes them feel welcome and connects them through the, uh, the whole community. So it's competitive uh, compensation, it's a competitive benefit plan, but the, the core, we find, is make, allowing those individuals to make a difference in the community and give back. So they want to, they want to connect with the community more and uh, we need to make sure that they, we give them those opportunities, both as an employer and as a community. Thank you both. So in a minute, we'll wrap up, and there's a, a couple minutes here for a couple quick questions. So if anybody has a question, start uh, thinking about that now. But I have one final quick question for all of you. Uh, the Economic Development Strategic Plan is a 10-year plan. So in a few words, uh, finish this thought. We will have succeeded in 10 years if we have done <laughs> a, few words, a, 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 a few words is very difficult for me, uh, but, but I, I think in 10 years, um, obviously, I'm hoping, because I am already a senior citizen, um, I'm hoping that we have listened to the recommendations that we've got today, that we take it seriously, and that we will be considered a destination location that brings talent, diversity, to our community, that we will be knowing as progressive, uh, a place to want to raise a family, uh, that will be viewed as a, having an excellent educational system, continuing to be that. And that, um, to me, the biggest thing 
that we're going to have to change is we don't have broadband in the state of Wisconsin like everyone else does. You can talk, yada, 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 but guess what? No, we don't. Um, that has to change. I think we also have to face the fact that transportation is going to need to change. You know, I was just out in Long Beach, and they all run around on scooters. They don't have, I would fall over if I did that scooter. But it's a different environment, and we have to make that change. Uh, we have a lot of people that are older in life or been around a long time are going to have to open their minds to change and to be nimble, be flexible, and look at what we need to bring to town. So in the end, we're going to be the place you want to be. Younger people that are here are going to want to stay here and not get the heck out of Dodge. Um, they're going to see us as progressive, a hub for uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, and keeping it a vibrant community that offers many, many opportunities to have a family work balance. That was not a few words, sorry. <laughs> I have that same problem. So. <laughs> I'll tell you a story first, and then I'll give you that vision second. Uh, I was down in Florida recently at a, at a business meeting and ran into an individual that was also there on a business front. And that individual, you know, we connected, and, and I said, he asked where, where I was from, and I said, Wausau, Wisconsin. And he said, that is the coolest Midwest town I've been to in the last 20 years. He happened to be up here on a Wednesday night uh, the 400 block and he ate in one of our restaurants came out and the band was playing and it was an experience that he was just so impressed by he, he said that was the coolest downtown experience i've had in that number of decades so we have something special here we have a community uh, and it goes beyond the buildings and the 400 block it's the people that we have in this room to get together to make this happen so uh, my vision is you know, in 10 years, if we're successful at this, uh, that there'll be a picture of the 400 block with hundreds and hundreds of people out there, and we're on the cover of Site Selection magazine with a quote of, how did Wasa make this happen? And that kind of vision is in front of us today, and we can make it happen. So that's what we were recently looking for places to go. Uh, the organization that we, we selected they simply bring the whole group. It's the, the political front, the business front, the educational front, and they make it happen. And it's not one discipline that can do it. It's all of us together that got to make this uh, vision come through. <clears throat> Let me take just a little different tack on this. In order to be where Jim wants us to be, and Lori wants us to be, and I know Matt and I want this to be 10 years from now, we have to have a good first year. Okay, we got to get off to a good start here. And where do you start? The, the prosperity partnership we talk about, right now that's an idea. It has to have capital. So that has to be invested in. The other is that, is it Clark Island? That building needs to be owned, has to be the home of that, has to be shared space for innovative companies. If we haven't accomplished all that a year from now, we're not well on that way, the next 10 years will be a lot like this year and will actually decline. So we've got to get out of the shoot, we've got to get out of it fast. There is urgency. I'll answer from the perspective of uh, 10 years out from the vision. For me, what it means is that everybody in this room, myself <laughs> included, actually wants to live here, wants your kids to live here and grow up, and couldn't imagine any other place to live. If we don't have that level of desire or passion, how can anybody else want to come, stay, and live here? So I would encourage us, everything we do, we have to, as we've heard some people talk, we're gonna to have to make sacrifices, we're gonna to have to make choices. Not everybody's gonna get everything they want, and everything's gonna go the way everybody wants it to go. But if we don't have that common vision and will and grit, which I see Wausau, and that's one of the things that's attracted me to Wausau. We've done it, when you go back and look at some of the events I've been to, and they talk about the history, some of the people who created the things, and some of the people who've done the things to make Wausau what it is, to reinvent the companies that we've had here. We've done it. We just have to do it again, and we're gonna have to do it in a very more inclusive way than we've historically done it, and we're gonna have to have the will to do it, and the passion to do it, knowing we're doing it for our kids and our families. Great. 
So there was a ton of wisdom uh, in the, that last response, and certainly over the last uh, you know, hour or so. Uh, and, but unfortunately, we've run out of time, and I want to respect all of your day. So if you have additional questions, uh, our panelists uh, certainly be around if you want to ask them specific questions. But uh, thank you to each of you for your time uh, and your thoughts today. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, a couple of uh, wrap-up uh, announcements as we end the day today is uh, I want to thank you all again uh, for attending. Uh, it is a great group gathered here today. I wasn't joking about locking the doors. Let's get this done like Brad said. Let's get out of the gate uh, because there's a lot of collective uh, wisdom and, and energy that can come out of uh, where we are today. Um, there will be a feedback on the program, so please look for that and respond as we continue to develop future programs like this uh, in the future and look for additional programs to come soon. A link uh, to the economic development plan will be provided shortly, and as always, please uh, jump onto the Wausau Chamber uh, website for additional information and watching for what's coming next from the Chamber. Again, I'd like to thank our uh, event sponsors, and specifically People State Bank. Thank you for your support of this event. Uh, and I want to wish all of you a great day, and thank you again for attending. Thank you.